I've spoken before about how this whole saga that we're living through is applying a giant filter to the world. And you really find that the people around you are divided between those who make it through the filter and those who don't. And on the side of the filter that has reason and courage, you meet some really interesting people, one of whom is Claire Craig, who I am very pleased to be talking with this morning. Now, I'm not going to go into Claire's immense qualifications and um, suitability to talk about the things we, we are going to speak about, because the one thing that has struck me about her is how clear, clear and, and forthright her communication is, and it speaks for itself. So Claire, thank you very much for uh, joining me here on this uh, uh, 220th day of the South African lockdown and the, what, 10th day of your second lockdown in the UK? Oh, that sounds so tame compared with yours. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> no, it's a real pleasure. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, a very uh, loaded high level question to get things going. Where, at what point, when did you realize that you needed to be speaking out? Um, the, the honest truth is a lot later in the day than a lot of people who were on this, you know, there were some really clever people who figured this out way before I did. And I, um, I was busy, in, which I think is true of a lot of people who, who haven't spoken out, that in order to sit down and go through it all and check everything from every direction to make sure that you're right, takes an awful lot of effort. And so I didn't do that until the beginning of September when my four children went back to school, because up until that point, I'd been quite busy with them. And I had been thinking that there were, I had been suspicious through the summer, that at this very low rate of diagnoses and deaths, that we were just calling false positives, and it was all just diagnostic error. And um, but I hadn't been like suspicious earlier than that, and I had still been really concerned about high levels of antibodies in some areas compared with others, suggesting that some places had a long way to go. So there was, you know, that I, I didn't, it, took, it was a process trying to get there to sort of um, look at the evidence, see where it took me. And then I actually wrote to Carl Hennigan to say, look, I, I, think, I think this, <laughs> I think we're making a mistake. What do I do? And he said, just get it out there, get a blog, get on Twitch, just get it out there somehow. And, um, and so I did. And then it's kind of progressed from there. That's interesting. And why are you speaking out? Other people have seen these facts and decided to stay silent about them. Um, so I think there's a combination of reasons, actually. I think one of the, the, the thing that I've just said about having the the time to investigate it is a big one. Because I think if you're a doctor and you are going to say something publicly, mm -hmm. you need to be really sure. And there's lots of reasons why people think they might be wrong when they're suspicious. One of the big reasons is the whole genome sequencing. So what we're doing, let me explain what that is. So what, what we're doing is um, patients are getting a swab and they're getting tested for COVID. And then the, the way that we're checking that that process is working is that we take the really good samples and we read every single letter of the DNA or RNA sequence from those samples. And so that's a really complex test and, it's, and it should be an accurate one because when you're reading that many letters of a code, it should be hard to go wrong. And... Um, I've done a little bit of work, not very much, a little bit of work on whole genome in the past, where I worked for the 100,000 Genomes Project, but just enough to give me the guts to say these things can go wrong. And, um, and so I, I can't, I'm, I'm not in a position to call it out completely. Other people need to do that. 
but I'm in a position to still be suspicious, including that information, whereas other people, I think they get shut down when someone says, no, but it can't be because we've read the whole sequence. Then they don't know how to respond to that because that sounds like very complicated, proper science, and they don't know how it could have gone wrong. Carl Hennigan was somebody you worked with before. What was your connection to him? Um, I was actually at medical school with him. We were at Oxford together. And I haven't spoken to him for 20 years. Um, but, you know, he was a good guy. And I saw that he had he put himself out there. Hmm. And I thought he'd have good advice to give. And he, and he did. So, yeah, we should, we should, I need to go and meet up with him again, really. It's been too long. Yeah, he's done a great job for many months now of calling out... Uh, uh, misinformation and uh, hysteria mm -hmm. it really has um, we've been following him for a long time but it was great when you burst on the scene uh, I can remember one evening Duncan Golliker saying uh, there's this uh, person who's quite interesting I think you should follow her uh, and I followed you and I think about 48 hours later I was DMing you and saying uh, hey let's have a, let's have a chat mm -hmm. um, very very interesting work work to see. I mean, I, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds of the, the technical, but I do think that there's one area that could be cleared up quite a lot because in this category of false positives, even though I'm a promoter of this uh, perspective that you need to be careful about them, that they, we can, the data can be extremely misleading, especially when prevalence rates are low. I still do see people saying, talking a lot of nonsense about false positives and trying to give them a fixed percentage, uh, mm. talking about them as if they're all in one category and confusing mm -hmm. the, the picture quite a lot. There are multiple types of false positive, aren't there? Uh, would you, do, you, do you have labels for them or terminology that, that you like to use for the different categories? Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, so the, I think the main difference is that there's, the equipment itself has a false positive rate. Yes. A lot of mathematicians particularly have got very fixated on that false positive rate, which is a low constant rate. And you can do quite fun maths using it around it. You know, if you repeat the testing, you can figure out in detail what it is. And you can but adjust it, your results once you know that rate to correct for them. Well, you could. Yes. Yeah. The trouble is, of course, that when you've got when, you, when you're doing testing with a false positive rate, you don't know, if, unless they're all false positive, you don't know that you're not missing one. So they're continuing to report it because some of it might be real, right? So there is a dilemma there, um, especially if you're not confirmatory testing. You know, if you did confirmatory testing, that, that problem would reduce, but it's not being done. Yeah. Um, but the, the thing in medicine is that um, there are a lot of different things that can go wrong. It's biology, not physics. And so there are lots more variables. So you, the false positive rate isn't just your equipment. It's everything from the patient right to the result. And anything that can produce an error in the process is what creates false positives. So fundamentally, there will be subpopulations that have a higher false positive rate within our population. And I think we saw that with people in their 20s. Mm. People in their 20s seem to produce false positives. And the reason I say that is they weren't very good at spreading it to other age groups, right? I mean, if you've got an infectious disease, it spreads between age groups. But what we had in the UK was throughout the whole of August, no other age group had it except people in their 20s. And that screams of it being a subpopulation with a higher false positive rate. But when we found that, instead of, you know, investigating it, questioning it, doing confirmatory testing, we just tested them a lot more. And if you find these little subpopulations that have a higher false positive rate and then dive in and test them extensively, you create a false positive pseudo-epidemic. A pseudo-epidemic. And what, to what do you attribute this early observation that the 20-somethings that the were generating positive tests? Oh, I've speculated on that. And I mean, it can only be speculation. And then that's what's quite frustrating from where I'm sitting is that, you know, I'm a scientist. I so want to do these experiments and find out what really is going on. Mm -hmm. And 
all I can do is make a hypothesis and show what data backs or doesn't back mm. the hypothesis, but I can't design the experiment and find out the truth. So my speculation uh, was that it was something to do with EBV, the virus that causes glandular fever, because we did actually see a slight rise in toddlers as well. And that's that's quite characteristic for that virus that so you have it. Epstein-Barr virus. That's the one. And yeah. Reason that um, I mean that sounds like quite a wacky idea, but I did look into it further, and there was a study from Wuhan where they showed that half of their COVID nineteen positive patients had an antibody in their blood that showed they'd had recent EBV infection, and I mean that's just extraordinary. Half of the patients. Wow. That's and what's the background pre prevalence rate for that? So I can't remember the age of the patients, but that would be critical to understanding that because mm. we, we almost all end up catching EBV when mm. we're young. Yes. But it, it's only really a sort of around in an active way in, in your toddler's eight years or in your 20s. And then we, our body suppresses. So you wouldn't have a problem with it later on unless you get problems with your immunity. Um, yeah, and there've also been um, people who've written about particular patients who they described as being co-infected with COVID-19 and EBV because they could show that they had recent EBV infection, which, you know, I just think you, that that doesn't, that's not how science should work. Like, you don't assume two things are happening at once. You try to find the underlying cause. Right. And, you know, I just, so I have my suspicions, but as I say, I have no proof. I haven't done experiments to prove it. Interesting. Um, let's, let's fast forward to the, the other type of um, false positive, which what you might call an, or what Professor Kuldoff calls a, uh, an epidemi epidemiological false positive um, arising from tests that have been run at very high cycle thresholds. Can you give us a crisp view on, on to what extent that is a major feature in this uh, data extravaganza? So, I mean, I think, I, th I think the thing to understand is that how you test is meant to change during an epidemic, right? So when you're going up the death curve, mm -hmm. what you try to do is find as many, all the possible cases, you want to find any possible case because you're trying to reduce the contacts and slow the spread. And the point of slowing the spread is not to stop the virus. We can't stop virus, but there is a purpose to it. You're slowing the spread so that at the point you reach herd immunity, you have the minimum number of people who've already caught it, who then have to go through the disease and some of them might die. And if you don't slow the spread, you go shooting up the, the case numbers. And when you reach herd immunity, a lot more people already have it and can't benefit from herd immunity, and some of them will die. So that's the purpose behind washing your hands and you know just mm. doing things in a, in a more in a different way to try and reduce spread. But when you reach peak deaths, there will always be a problem with false positives unless you switch that strategy. So you have to switch from trying to find every possible case to trying to only find definite outbreaks. Mm -hmm. So it's no more about the individual patient. You're trying to find an outbreak in a population. And once you've identified an outbreak in a population, you can go and test the people involved in a more sensitive way to try and be sure you've got the possible cases in the outbreak. But unless we're finding definite outbreaks, you are gonna end up in a mess. And so the CT thresholds, were set really high at the beginning. And I actually, you know, I mean, they are crazy high in retrospect, but if you'd asked me at the time when we had this new virus coming in spring and we didn't know how contagious and how many were susceptible and we didn't know very much at all, then I would have also pumped up the CT thresholds because I would want to be finding absolutely anything possible. And the harm from overdiagnosing at that point is not as significant. But when you reach that peak death, you need to do everything you can to get the diagnosis right. And the first step with that is you put in a gateway. You say, we're not going to test everybody. We're only going to test the ones we really think might be COVID, right? So then you reduce the volume of coming through the labs. 
And that allows the labs to concentrate on quality of the reports because a lab can't do volume and speed and quality. They can do two of those three. Right. And we did volume and speed at the beginning on the way up the death curve, but now we want speed and quality. So you reduce the volume by having a gateway about who you test. And then, then for the testing itself, you need to reduce the CT thresholds and you need to reduce them right down because you only want to find absolutely definite outbreaks. And so a CT threshold of, say, I think it's about 25 is going to give you 50-50 chance of it being culturable virus. So above that, the other thing you do is where you might have said, well, we found two of the three gene sites in our testing. You should be looking for all three. Two should not be enough anymore. Mm. And there's a lot of differences between different countries and how they've gone about that. And I wish people were more open in their protocols because it would have helped a great deal if we could see those differences. But that's what, that's what I would have done at peak deaths. And it's a really hard call because at peak deaths, people are at maximal fear, maximum we're getting this wrong. And so to make those changes is difficult, but we still haven't made them now. Well, we've done the opposite. Uh, instead of oh, yeah. pulling back on the, the sensitivity, we've pushed it up. And we are months after our peak. Our peak was in July. Um, and we're doing single gene location um, cycle threshold 37 to 40 in some labs. Other, so we have a vast, it appears anecdotally that there's big differentials in our labs as to exactly what thresholds they're testing to and uh, yes. how many gene locations. But um, yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of this has come about because of the antibody testing. So um, most people have been talking about PCR testing as being the problem, but actually the interpretation of the antibody test is fundamental to understanding what's gone on. And because people in charge of this fully believe they're dealing with a susceptible population. I don't think there's malice here. I think they honestly believe that that's who they're responsible for. They're responsible for a susceptible population and a deadly virus. Mm. They think they need to hunt out anything mm. still. And that, that's still about the antibody testing mm. is that what, we, what we've done almost entirely globally is used a, you, when you do a test, you have to have a group that you want to test positive and a group you want to test negative, right? So the group you want to test positive, the manufacturers used blood from patients in hospital with COVID, which is fine. And the group they wanted to test negative were blood donor samples from before COVID arrived, which is also fine if you're designing a test to show who had COVID. So they designed a really good test to show who had COVID, but it doesn't show who is immune to COVID. And it's been interpreted as that. Mm. And it really that and there's so much evidence all the evidence comes together and it all tells us the same story which is that more than half of us were immune before COVID arrived so you can get that story from the antibodies by looking at it in a different way you get that story from other aspects of the immune system you get it from the fact that the household transmission studies show that people with COVID only ever maximally managed to give it to half of the people they lived with so, you know, whichever way direction you look at it, mm. half of it has been before. Mm. And then in the UK, we now have 7% who had COVID, mm. and more than half plus 7% gets you to herd immunity. That's, that's it. We're there. Right. right. And, um, it, I mean, it's, it's fascinating for me what you talk about is this, this, this uh, sort of deep, deep, deeply held conviction that some people have that we're all susceptible. Um, there's a deadly new virus to which we're all susceptible. You know, that's the idea that's out there. Yeah. And yeah. the more I've gotten into it, the more I realize that all three elements of that are completely incorrect. It's, it's, not, a new, it's not a new virus. This is an uh -huh. individuum of a, a virus that's very well recognized by human immune systems. Um, that makes it, A, not deadly for most people. And or another way of putting that is that a minority, some minority are susceptible to developing the disease if infected. And yeah. um, it, it's, but it's been passing strange for me that with all the evidence regarding the mechanics of this now, the detail of the T cell reactivity, the, 
the, and across many populations with the evidence from Sweden where and with no NPIs of any significance, their population, their death curve turns and plummets. Um, yeah. it, you know that this is happening. It, it, it's, it's beyond any reasonable doubt that there is uh, minority susceptibility, not universal susceptibility, and and yet, as far as I can tell, most of the the public health and medical fraternity are behaving as if none of this was true. They are, and I think I mean, there's been I think even scientists are influenced by what's in the media. You know, we just if the story keeps being told in the same way every day, and you're surrounded by people who are fearful then that does have an effect on your thinking. I'm sure it does. Mm. And, um, and, but I do find it odd that people are so ready to accept that other parts of the world can reach herd immunity and it be over, you know, mm. that some of them have been through longer, difficult stretches, but nobody's expecting Brazil and Peru to have a second wave, right? So they're allowed herd immunity. Why, why can't we have herd immunity? Why are we banned from having the same as other places? And and we have the thing that worries me about Sweden. Obviously, I'm so you know Sweden are the heroes for doing what they did, and thank goodness one country did. But they are now testing too much. They're testing and testing, and they're about to do the same thing. Yes, I, I'm worried about that as well. It's uh, very clear that they're. Uh, going on a, a, a testing bonanza, and there, there's also it's also manifestly clear that there's an enormous amount of international political pressure being placed on the political leaders, um, and yes. that's starting to filter into their laws and parliamentary processes, um, and that is disturbing uh, for me. Um, let's talk about the politics and the psychology of this a little bit, moving off the science for a while, if you don't mind. Um, have you succeeded? in talking anybody down from a position of intense fear and panic? I, I, I don't think I've talked them all the way down. I think a lot, of people keep, a lot of people who I've talked to end up swinging between what they believe. And so at one moment they think, well, maybe Claire's right and maybe I'm wrong and that or whoever else is wrong but then they'll hear something that will make them swing back again and um and again you know when 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 agreeing with me and coming to that belief puts you into the minority that's a difficult step to take isn't it that that you then you then have to you can't you have to believe the whole thing to be able to then and then be able to defend it and until you've got through, gone through all the work required mm. to change your mind like that fully enough to defend yourself against the majority who disagree with you, then how do you make that step? How many times have you been called a, a COVID denier or a COVID idiot? I've been called all sorts of names. I've been reported to the Royal College of Pathologists several times. I'm pretty sure I've been reported to the GMC several times. Um, yeah, I've I've been attacked horribly, but I kind of I I the way I see it is that both sides believe lives are at stake. So that's hugely emotionally driven. And so people who think that I'm wrong and think that therefore what I'm saying is going to kill people, they're driven by emotion and they attack. And I kind of I can when I look at it through that lens. I can handle all the attacks because, you know, they're not doing it because they're bad people. They're doing it because they think I'm one. <laughs> but, you know what I mean? They just, they just want the right thing. It's just that they're coming at it from the wrong angle. But the interesting thing for me is there's an asymmetry here. I mean, I've watched your, uh, your uh, public utterances and I never see in them even the faintest of suggestions of calling somebody else an idiot or, um, or casting any slur in their direction, even when you get emotional about um, what you're seeing, uh, the, the emotion is poured into the way you are trying to convince 
not into some kind of name calling episode. Um, and I often look at that and I see an asymmetry because the response that comes back is the COVID yet, the COVID denier of some sort, you know, one of those types of responses. And that mm. intrigues me. Um, it's, there's, there's something, my, 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 my sort of conjecture regarding this is that there is something perceived as deeply threatening in what you are saying mm -hmm. in a way that you don't feel with respect to people who see the world differently from you. And the thing that's very unusual about that is you and I are in a minority. Most people are on the other side. So why would somebody in the majority kind of uh, the herd view, if you like, the herd mentality view, a person who's got, doesn't have to look very far to find uh, an ally or a person who will endorse their beliefs. Why would they get so upset about the minority view that they immediately go into the name calling? Do you have any uh, ideas on this? Yeah, I mean, I have, there is a lot of that. I, I absolutely agree with that observation that, I mean, that, that does seem to happen an awful lot. And, and they, and I will always come back at them with more evidence because I am trying to persuade and because I, I can, I, you know, the, the whole point of a pseudo epidemic is that everybody in it believes it's an epidemic. That's the whole point of it, mm. right? It's, it creates a delusion. And mm. so they're frightened because they see COVID deaths numbers rising mm. and suggest it's something else. They're like, this is craziness. Look at these, this one thing that I've seen. Mm. <laughs> and, and trying to persuade them that there's, you know, I mean, it, the mass behind it and the reasoning behind it is counterintuitive and slightly complicated. It's yes. not something easily explained to anybody, like to, to literally anybody. You have to sit them down for, you know, even before, when I first was taught about it, you know, I was in a lecture, I was taught this stuff, right? And I was taught how you deduced whether, what, that, what was real and what was not. Mm. Um, it required uh, several steps of explanation. You can't just you can't just show people one thing, and whenever you do show them one thing, they can come up with a narrative, which is I, I quite like this about science. There's always a narrative, isn't there? No matter what you find, you can come up with something. But there are some things that really we we're seeing the data do now that just has no narrative. You just can't come up with biological reasons. I mean, you've been very forthcoming about this. You've called the 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 death curves and the cases curves essentially fraud. So yeah, I mean, the thing is, I don't think COVID's gone. I don't think COVID will be gone. And I, there's actually some lovely work being done by um, Joel Smalley. He calls himself at real Joel Smalley. Okay. He, um, he's just been digging into all of the data we have in the UK. And we do have great data in the UK. Um, and finding hotspots and showing where the real COVID is. But it's hidden, it's hidden by all of the false positives. So, I mean, that's the other irony, isn't it? That actually there is real COVID out there, mm. but doing what we're doing is not helping those patients at all because, because <laughs> we're, we're so distracted by all of the, the stuff that we're getting wrong mm. that we're not actually finding where it's real and making sure, that, you know, we're doing the best by those patients. Mm. Here's the thing that fascinates me, and I would like to get your perspective on it. I was always skeptical about the, the, the uh, assumed level of curve, curve flattening that would emerge from NPIs, whether we're talking about lockdowns or mask wearing um, or social distancing more broadly. Um, I, I always just had an intuitive feeling that the kind of 50% reductions in reproduction rates and so on were a little bit overcooked. But for me, a surprising story has been the complete absence of any signal in the data for the effectiveness of these regime changes as they're implemented and released. Um, I mean, from in country after country, you just find nothing. And I'm talking about now, primarily the, the shape of the epidemic death curves in their 
prime in their first waves in their epidemic phases. Um, mm -hmm. And it's made the, it, the the virus very predictable. I mean, we we set up a curve in May, um, which is out by the tiniest fractions. You know, it's it's really um, quite bizarre to see that. Um, and that that was for the whole of South Africa. Uh, we've made the, the, the margin for error at a, as you go more fine grained on the on the provincial data and so on is obviously a little bit bigger. But if I look at what has gone on in the country with five different stages of lockdown and uh, mask mandates, and then you know uh, varying levels of uh, of regulations under these lockdown stages and so on, the virus doesn't seem to take notice of any of this. No. So I mean, to be honest, this is slightly outside of the stuff I've looked at, and the, certainly there are value calculations I haven't even looked into at all. But the, the, the principle that you don't see any kind of um, changing gradient on those lines, they just keep going, they just keep going, um, does seem to hold true. But I, I do think hand washing makes a difference. You know, I do think there are some things that we did at the beginning that will have... Um, that, pe pe that people started doing early on and have carried on with sort of thing. Well, no, I mean, I think the, thing, the point is that I think we... I think it is, well, I think it may be possible to slow spread of a virus mm. by days to weeks. You know, so if you just manage to slow it by a day between each contact, mm. then you can slow it a little bit, but you can't stop it. You slow it a bit so that you'd see quite smooth curves as it, as it you know, the slowing would just mean that it, it peaks a little bit later, but you wouldn't notice a change in the curve. It would just be slower. Mm. And I have one little graph which I quite like where I looked at um, when each hospital in England had their maximum deaths per day mm. sorted them and I looked at the first 30 hospitals to peak and the last 30 hospitals to peak and you can't compare the size of the peaks because they're serving different populations I didn't control for that mm. but the first 30 hospitals to peak um, the shape goes shooting up. It's almost vertical. Yeah. And then it peaks and comes down in a way we've seen elsewhere. But the last 30 comes up much more slowly, peaks a good month later than the first 30, which shows it kept spreading throughout the country over that period, even though we were in lockdown. And then it comes down. And so the thing about that slow rise of the later hospital deaths is that there's a variety of things that could account for it, but it could be some of the interventions. It could be something about population density, and I haven't looked at population density, and maybe that's all it is. But it's those, those places that were in that last 30 are the places that um, seem to have real COVID now, which is also really interesting because it means it kind of raises the question that, you know what I was saying earlier about overshooting on the deaths? Mm. So oh, um, I think London probably overshot on the deaths, overshot on spread. So when London reached herd immunity, we had a lot of people who already had it and we had more deaths. But London is fine now. Mm. You know, we, we're, we're not affected in the way other parts of the country are. Right. Whereas a country where we maybe minimise deaths, mm. then you've got, it, have got a problem now. And the thing with herd immunity is it's not necessarily one figure throughout the year. So in spring, we've got good levels of vitamin D, we're a healthier bunch generally, we're not susceptible to influenza in spring either. And so you might not need that many people to be immune for it to stop. Um, but in autumn, you might need to top up before it will stop. Yeah. And I think that might be what we were seeing. So even those interventions that meant yeah. it's maybe just postponed it till now. Mm. Have, have you spent any time looking at uh, Federico Lovis and uh, Levin uh, Jeparidze's um, model, modeling paper? I haven't, I haven't. Should I look at that? Tell me you that. should, because they kind of predict this, this sort of thing. They're the only people who have convinced oh. me that there may actually be um, some effect from uh, locking down. Uh, of course, it's not, okay. a, it's not a good effect. The one that they right. described, but it's—I I had such 
uh, uh, skepticism after spending hours and hours with the data and looking at the correlations and uh, autocorrelations and so on, that I was just so deeply skeptical. I, I kind of took the view, no, we've got to rethink the whole of transmission because uh, it, 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 there should be some effect and I'm not finding any effect. Um, and yeah. until I read their paper and then it got me thinking and I realized, okay, well, this lack of relationship between mortality um, and uh, lockdown stringency could actually be something you expect, you know, if lockdown is effective because it differentially alters the, the mobility of the vulnerable and the non-vulnerable groups, forcing the burden onto the vulnerable. Um, mm -hmm. And so when they opened my eyes to that kind of thinking, I, I think I reduced my sort of judgmental approach to evaluation of, of lockdowns and um, some yeah. of the work that they've done you know, they actually forecast resurgences being stronger in uh, places like Madrid. Um, and, uh, and, and so very interesting work, very clever mathematically as well. They came up with some wonderful approximations that allow them to uh, maintain the richness and complexity of the modeling environment while still being able to fit it to actual in-country data, which was, I think, a major, the inability to do that was one of the major flaws of models like the Imperial model and the models that the South African guys were using. Um, okay. That's really horrific though. So that everything we did caused more harm, everything. Yes, I, I think that is sadly the case. Um, and, but I think worse than locking down and shifting burden onto the, the vulnerable is the, the combined effect of the panic and hysteria. I, I really do believe that when you maintain fear and force people indoors and bump them out of their normal lives and force the stresses of economic uh, deprivation onto them that you worsen susceptibility to disease. It can't be otherwise. And um, you know, even in, in, in developing countries, you must also evaluate the, the knock-on effects of uh, decrease in quality of diet because that's the kind of the brutal reality of uh, yes, uh, yeah. brutalizing people's livelihoods, you know? And so yeah. I think that it's the second order things that have been more dangerous than, than the first order impacts of lockdown in terms of the effect, the immediate effects of social distancing. I do think those have been bad as well. But um, yeah, that, that kind of is the, for me, the saddest part is the, the brutality. Um, people think they're doing something responsible and helping and being healthy, but there's actually a lack of empathy. It's easy to make that call from behind your, your Zoom screen. But for the, the vast majority of people out there, that's not a luxury they have, you know, to, to yeah. so they actually stay exposed while you protect yourself. And it's kind of selfish in a way, if, you, if you're one of the non-vulnerable people, that that's what you're doing. You're forcing um, the less, the less well-off economically, the, the more vulnerable people, almost by definition, onto the front of the bus, if I can use uh, mm. it as quote. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, that for me is particularly galling thought. Um, but one that I can't get away from. Yeah, um, yeah. Are you fearful of anything right now? Y yes. <laughs> um, I, so I'm fearful um, that people are too far in and need to protect their positions because they don't have choices, right? So the, the, our government have set themselves up Mm -hmm. to carry on down this route or fail. There isn't another way out anymore. I'm also fearful about what happens when people realise what's happened and get angry. I mean, maybe they won't. Maybe people are, can see that it, it was confusing because they were confused too, and so maybe they'll be forgiven. But I, I, think I do have a, a bit of fear about that. What about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm fearful of the consequences of, of what has happened and I'm fearful of the consequences of what is yet to happen. Um, there seems to be some quite dangerous doubling down going on um, and I worry about the consequences of these uh, quite uh, political agendas mandatory vaccinations, travel passports, um, people beginning to talk about having to lock down until the end of 2023 is the longest date I've seen. Um, 
the whole narrative around the great reset and the new normal and uh, an opportunity to what is it uh, bring back what is what is the saying build back better build back better yes yeah These vacuous phrases with the yes, I, I like to think that a lot of that is convergent opportunism that's Michael Eden's um, yes Yes. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting. I'd, I'd used the phrase when I heard Michael Eden say that I'd been using the phrase um, a convergence of, uh, sorry, a confluence of incentives um, to explain how there were all of a sudden multiple people from different walks all seemingly beating the same drum. Um, and uh, I think, I think you know, they're both slightly nuanced uh, differences between the two formulations, but they're broadly saying the same thing, which is there was no plan, no conspiracy. It's kind of just people uh, seeing an opportunity or being exposed to an incentive that drives them to maintenance of a status quo, regardless of how non-optimal that is for the rest of us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, I guess part of the reason for me thinking that is that um, the, the government in the UK have taken on a hell of a lot of power over this, that they've removed power from parliament, but the parliamentary MPs, they're all supporting them still. Yes. Generally. And they, and so, and you know, we're trying to sort of gradually work our way through trying to persuade them, but there's an awful lot of persuading to be done with people who are not mostly don't have a scientific background, which makes it tricky. Mm. Um, but they, I, so I think when I see that, I think that, I, do, I think that probably the government are in the same place they are with the thinking, you know, why wouldn't they be also believing it all? I think most people believe it all, and why wouldn't they believe it all? And the doctors believe it. I mean, this is part of the problem, is that the doctors believe it, and the doctors in practicing medicine, like what we do is um, pull together all the information we can. We talk in depth to the patient, try and figure out what's going on with the patient. We and then we do tests and pull together all the information around the tests, and then we use logical reasoning to come up with. A diagnosis and we make that decision and we tell the patient and when we do that we expect the patient to totally buy into that belief because we're telling them this is your diagnosis mm. and by doing that we also buy into that belief mm. so the treating them believe when they've made a diagnosis that that is what's wrong with the patient now, I've, you know, I haven't done a postmortem for years, but when I was doing postmortems, you would see patients who had been misdiagnosed. And it would happen with all sorts. It wasn't a very common thing, but it would happen. And it would happen sometimes in quite shocking ways. I saw a woman in her 20s who died of appendicitis that had been missed. I mean, horrible. But the doctors believed there was something else wrong with her. And so they didn't, you know, get it right. And so, you know, we can make mistakes. And when, you, when you're trying to pull together all the evidence and you've got a test that's giving you wrong information, then you are likely to make a mistake, but you're also likely to believe it still. And so the doctors are, think they're treating this. And they think they're, they're treating real COVID. And the thing is that some of them are. So I think the doctors are the most prone to getting it wrong are the ones that saw a real case of COVID that week. So if you've just seen a real one and you've got another patient with a positive test who's coughing, then you're going to have a very low threshold for completely buying into that idea. Well, we, we one of the Panda members um, is a doctor and who was speaking to another doctor who had uh, a fairly bad, you know, severe flu-like symptoms, a, pro a, proper, a proper bout of COVID had recovered fully. Um, was walking around with the mask and he said to him, you know, why, why, are you, why are you doing that? You know, you've been infected, yeah. you've recovered. And he said, no, 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 uh, you can get reinfected by this thing and it can make me sick again. Um, and, you know, the, 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 to hear that coming from a doctor's mouth, you know, the, the layers of uh, negation of basic medical immunological knowledge that that are, that are that are going through that doctor's mind to get him to say that you know mm -hmm. it's quite i find that kind of thing quite scary yeah i find that really alarming 
um, informed people, you know. And I think, again, though, I think it's a lot about people um, leading busy lives. So, yes, he completely understands everything he's been taught about virology in the past. Mm -hmm. but, and he's doing a really, really busy day job. He doesn't have time to yes. investigate virology now. Yes. And then the world tells him, and authoritative people tell him, this is different. This virus is unlike any other we've seen before. <laughs> yes. He, you know, does he stop and question that and actually read all the immunology books again so that he can say, no, it's not? <laughs> because it takes a lot of effort, doesn't it? Right, right. Yeah, I think that's a very um, an astute uh, perspective in that situation. Talk to me a little bit. Do you have any ideas on uh, the importance of asymptomatic transmission? Yeah, I do. I think, I think people... I think what we've got wrong with COVID is uh, all about testing, as you know. So the, when you have a syndrome or a disease, uh, it's defined by what the doctor sees, right? The doctor sees this patient who has shortness of breath, cough, tightness of the chest, you know, low saturation with oxygen, all of that picture, mm -hmm. that was COVID. Mm. And you design a test that can pick up COVID but the syndrome, the disease, the symptoms should be the definition. Mm. And we completely turned that on its head. And instead, the test became the definition. Yes. When you do that, the number of symptoms gets longer and longer and longer and longer. And then you include asymptomatic people because it's a test defining it and not the syndrome. Right. Which is absolutely rubbish. It's just nonsense. And, and the, the other thing that I find extraordinary is that some doctors even seem to think that our immune systems act like a, a bubble around us. That yes, that the virus bounces off your skin. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's not immunity. It can go in, it doesn't invade. It has to. It's what so the asymptomatic people, people who are PCR positive but have no symptoms, have immunity. That is what immunity is. Yes. They're not diseased. They are immune. That's right. You've been infected and you didn't generate symptoms, you're immune. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've often joked that a better name for, for this virus than uh, coronavirus disease, or sorry, a better name for the disease than coronavirus disease would have been asymptomatic SARS or, uh, or immune SARS. Yeah. Uh, because it's, it's kind of, uh, most, you know, this idea that you, you, you call it a COVID case on the basis of a test, even though the thing, the term COVID contains the word disease, yet yes. none of the people are diseased. Yeah. You know, yeah. that that to me is has been the complete uh, travesty here, is uh, and and the responsible for a great the greater part of the malarkey than anything else. Yeah, yeah. So the other thing about asymptomatic spread, right, mm -hmm. is that um, people refer to three types of evidence when they're talking about asymptomatic transmission. The first they refer to is people being PCR positive who are asymptomatic, which I think we've covered. That's mm -hmm. fine. Then they say, but you can actually culture the virus from these people that are asymptomatic. You're like, yeah, that's still immunity. That's fine also. Yes. To transmit the virus, you know, transmission occurs at least in a part because of the coughing. So that when virus goes into your lungs and it replicates in the cells and then it bursts the cells open, you end up with raw surface of your lungs which causes you to feel unwell and cough and have symptoms and it's the coughing that's producing viral particles into the environment that people inhale and so even the evidence about how much pre-symptomatic people transmit you know they transmit way less than once you're coughing and coughing's the biggie sure um, but the other evidence the evidence of just like where they try to show who caught it from whom. So you get these studies of, you know, like the person sat on a bus and these people on the bus caught it, that kind of thing. Um, and so the studies each individually end up being quite anecdotal. So yeah. they're meaningless until you pull them all together. Mm. Um, and if you go back to the raw data and say, right, where is this data about asymptomatic super spreaders? Where does it come from? There are two lots of evidence. There's a pile of evidence saying asymptomatic super spreaders is a true, real, scary, important thing that we have to be terrified of. And it's, you know, they really spread it. And then there's a pile of evidence that says, 
we completely failed to find that. We looked and looked and we just didn't find that asymptomatic people managed to spread it at all. And the ones that say it's real are all published in China. And then what's happened is people have come along and they've taken both those piles and they've mixed them together and taken an average number. Right. And said, so, you know, some, somebody from some kind of authoritative Western university will publish a paper taking both of those sources of evidence and using an average number and saying, this is a fact. And so everybody has then believed it because it's being put into these meta-analyses. What did you make of Maria Kirkover um, coming out that day all of a sudden without any warning and telling the world that asymptomatic transmission was rare? I, I thought she was a hero. I really did. I loved that interview. She's a WHO woman, yeah? Director of Science. Yes. And, um, and, and then the next day, the, w, the World Health the Organization next... forcing her to walk it back. Yeah, that was quite disturbing. How do you think the World Health Organization is going to climb down from this position? Can they? I don't know. I think it's a sort of living organism, the World Health Organization. You know, people come and go, ideas come and go. I don't think it will disappear at the end of all of this, but I think people might need to change. Yeah. Claire, it's been great talking to you. Um, and wonderful to have you on board and helping us at Panda. We really appreciate it. Um, I think we have a long battle ahead of us still. This, these levels of fear, this degree of misinformation. Um, and as you've correctly pointed out, how do, how do people climb down? Um, mm -hmm. I can't see a mechanism. I thought maybe the vaccine was going to be one, but then I saw Fauci on TV the other day saying that even if... Uh, um, even if everybody gets vaccinated, we'll probably still have to wear masks in lockdown. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, um, and I don't want to get going on him uh, because he, he perplexes me more than anybody else. I mean, I can sort of understand Tedros some of the time, but uh, Fauci for me is a mystery because he called it all correctly, saying that this was going yes, to be a, he did. Minor, yeah. a minor story. And you no also asymptomatic spread. directly yeah. about asymptomatic transmission, you know, saying... Yeah. There's no other diseases where that's important, you know. Um, but then he suddenly became the main uh, panic merchant in the world, you know. Um, and I, I just don't know. I, I, I don't understand it. Um, it, it. I thought he would maybe, maybe it was political and maybe he would uh, slow down once uh, Trump was uh, defeated in an election. Um, but that hasn't happened. He's just carried on. It's quite bizarre. Did I either. But I just, I mean, I, I think, you know, Hanlon's razor, Hanlon's razor is that you should never attribute to malice what could be perfectly well described by incompetence. Yes. And I'm a great believer in Hanlon's razor. Yes, yes, I, I think that's correct. I've, I've tried to talk people out all the time from this idea that there's a conspiracy. Um, I, I just don't see it. I, 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 I point out to them, I say, look, you're making the same mistake as the, as the coronavirus panic team. You know, you, you're, you're, you're looking at the information and going, oh, it's terrible. There's a, there's a conspiracy. That's, you know. And I also point out to them that uh, the fact that there isn't a conspiracy may be even more worrying than if there, is, if there was one, you know. If there were a couple of bad guys in the room if we, who were exposed yeah. and had manipulated the whole situation, and then, then we could all move on past this. But I think it's, it's even harder and creepier to understand what has gone on if you assume that there hasn't been a conspiracy. <laughs> yes. You know, uh, because so many people have fallen for something. So many people have gone mad despite the abundance of evidence to refute their positions. Um, yeah. And Sorry. I, think, I think part of this is that every country had their pandemic plans, right? And part of the pandemic plan is to shut down dissenting voices. Like, you know, they have, they have a plan for how they're gonna shut down dissenting voices. And they have people whose jobs it is to do that and they're busy trying to do that. Right. But what, the effect that that has on the people who are trying to run the show is that when they hear something contrary to their view, they shut it out. They think this is you know, a distraction from the courts. And they don't listen. They didn't listen to anybody telling them they were wrong. 
and and that's become i think that's part of the culture of how they've run it is that any voice that is outside of the bubble think is is not only you, you just don't listen to it because it will just confuse you you've got to focus focus on the, Get the deadly virus. Of, yeah. of, of persuading people to socially distance or whatever it is make yeah. sure that they're sufficiently scared yeah okay well I think we better wrap it up. It's been uh, the half hour turned into an hour. My favourite um, sin of uh, conversation, uh, and I'm I'm, I'm sure um, the editors are going to fight with me again over this, and I'll be shouted at until the end of the week. Um, but testament to a very interesting conversation, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, keep it up. I admire your courage, and I admire your clarity and uh, your your commitment to getting clarity and perspective out there thank you thank you very much nick and thanks for all you're doing as well with panda and everything thank you very much claire bye-bye thanks claire bye-bye